Helani, thanks for the invite. Uh, really uh, glad to uh, be here as part of this program. Uh, the talk last week by Hans uh, was great, and uh, Kelly's going to be up next week. Uh, and we're looking forward to that as well. And uh, also, uh, Suzanne will be talking at the end of the month. So um, as Mahalani said, uh, uh, my affiliation here is with the University of Hawaii at Manoa. But there's a little bit of an asterisk there, I would, and I would have to uh, uh, explain that with a little bit of a, a disclaimer. You know, with some folks, um, the question, uh, you know, what do you do and who do you work for is a fairly simple and straightforward question. You know, uh, uh, Joe, what do you do? Well, I'm a, I'm a banker and I work for First Hawaiian Bank. Um, you know, Sally, what do you do? Well, I'm a doctor and I work for Straw. You know, Kelly, what do you do? I'm a maritime archaeologist and I work for NOAA. Okay, uh, Don, what do you do? Well, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit complicated. And uh, so I'll, I'll just explain just a little bit of my background to give you an idea of where that brings me uh, to this project, but also how, how important uh, this particular area is to me uh, personally. Um, I am a, I'm a Colonel in the Marine Corps Reserve and I've uh, uh, been a Marine for uh, just over 26 years. And I've been in Hawaii for almost all that time. Uh, in 1990, the Marine Corps uh, sent me to Hawaii, and I forgot to go home, uh, as they say. I did my active duty tour. I was uh, with the Assault Amphibian Detachment at Marine Corps Base Hawaii. Then we called it Marine Corps Air Station uh, Kaneohe Bay, over there at Mokapu, on the other side of the island. Um, and, and that's where I was for my first tour. Um, when I got in the reserves, um, I did uh, some of my time in uh, fourth, with Fourth Force Recon, and then I was up at uh, Camp Smith for a large amount of that time. And I'm still doing my reserve duties uh, at uh, Camp Smith now. I was lucky enough in 2011 to get to be the Deputy Operations Officer for Marine Corps Base Hawaii. So I got to go back to Mokapu to my old home uh, for, for about nine months, and that was, and that was a real treat. Um, since, I, since I got promoted, I haven't done as much active duty. Most of the, most of the time I've been in the reserves, I've, I've actually been on active duty. But in the last three years, not as much. Uh, for most of the last three years, I've been teaching uh, history at Winwood Community College uh, on a full-time basis. I teach uh, uh, the, some of the world history classes, but I also teach uh, history of Hawaii. And I also do that, I've done that part-time with, uh, with uh, uh, Hawaii Pacific University as well, teaching the world history courses. They're going to have me teach history of Hawaii for the first time starting next month. The class is called Living History of Hawaii, and I'm actually going to be teaching it on base at, you guessed it, Mokapu, uh, where Marine Corps Base uh, Hawaii is. So again, uh, there's um, some associations there. Um, the reason that uh, I'm not, I'm actually not teaching full time for Windward. I'm only teaching uh, uh, an online class this semester. And the reason for that is because I just got a new job as a contract archaeologist working for a scientific consultant services, SCS. Um, so this is my first foray into contract archaeology. It's very interesting. The current project I'm working on is I'm doing some archaeological monitoring on a new sewage line that's uh, being put in where you guessed it on Mokapu at Marine Corps Base, uh, just west of the uh, of the runway where that is now. So lots of things uh, bringing me back uh, to Mokapu. Um, so, but that's not my first stint with archaeology. I've been an archaeologist for for quite a while. I got my master's in uh, 2007 from East Carolina University, same place that uh, Dr. Hans Van Tilburg uh, got his uh, master's degree and where Kelly uh, got her uh, PhD. But my first, my first work in uh, maritime archaeology was back in 1996 with the MAST course. MAST stands for Maritime Archaeology Survey Techniques course from the University of Hawaii at Manoa through the uh, Marine Option Program. Uh, like I say, my first one was in 1996. But the first course that was done was in 1993 at Mahukona Harbor on the Big Island, on the wreck of what, what was later concluded by myself to be the uh, remains of the steamer uh, Kauai. I wasn't on that project in 93, but I ended up doing my master's thesis on that project. 94, the second field school that they did, the second mass course, was on the uh, Catalina at 1994, same location where we went to in uh, 20, uh, 2015. So my first time, though, was in 96. The instructor was Dr. Hans Van Tilburg, and he's been my mentor uh, ever since. I helped out with a few more field schools as a crew chief and uh, as a, uh, a dive uh, supervisor. Kelly and I worked together on, on her first field school in uh, 2001 up on the night. There have been some great projects. Uh, there was a little bit of a hiatus uh, with respect to field schools in the mid-2000s, but they started back up again uh, about seven or eight years ago. 
Um, and I didn't get to didn't get to help out with the first couple, but uh, uh, I had the honor in 2014 of getting invited uh, by uh, Hans Van Tilburg to help out with the uh, mass course as a volunteer uh, and his assistant site supervisor. And we, we worked on some landing craft on the south shore of uh, Oahu. And then in 2015, he invited me back again to help out with, uh, with this site uh, where we went back to the same site we went to in, or they went to in uh, 1994. So it all kind of uh, comes full circle. But um, so very much an honor to be able to participate in that project again because it's a very that place is very very important to me and and i'd always uh heard about uh, that project and, and and missed that i didn't uh, get to uh, participate with that uh back in 94. we had a pretty good team and some of the people listed on there uh or some of the people who participated are listed there we had uh eight students uh six of them were first year students and two of them were uh second year so they were kind of helping us out on the staff uh, hans was in charge i was his uh, number two and Jeff Kubara from uh, Marine Option Program uh, was helping out as well as, as he always does. And Sabina Van Tilber, that's Hans' daughter. She's always the uh, cook, and she uh, cooks all the meals for us, which is which is very very important. She's the most important part of the uh, most important part of the whole team, to be honest with you. Um, several agencies were listed, which I have to uh, would have to mention. The NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. That's where Don, Dr. Hans Van Tilber works. That's that's his that's his day job. And it's kind enough. They're kind enough to let him spend some of his time helping out with the field schools in the summer, uh, which is a treat. But it's uh, Noah's involvement really goes beyond that in a lot of these field schools, particularly in the last couple. And I think that's worth uh, mentioning is that uh, for both the last two field schools, 2014 and 2015, uh, not only did, did did Noah provide the uh, instructor and the supervisor, but also. Uh, the the boats and the boat crews and in the in the diving operation itself. These were NOAA diving operations that the University of Hawaii divers were participating in on reciprocity. Those are details that a lot of people don't really uh, don't really care too much about. But for, for those of us in the field, those those things are very very important. And so uh, it, was, it was very much appreciated that NOAA has been able to uh, contribute uh, that. Um, again, Hans was in charge of this project. He was kind enough to let me uh, give the talk. Still has the NOAA logo up in the uh, upper right-hand corner. Um, University of Hawaii uh, Marine Option Program, again, that's uh, has always supported the uh, field schools. Marine Corps Base Hawaii Environmental uh, Division, a very important. They're, they're basically the ones who invited us uh, and, and allowed us to uh, participate. Um, but it also works out great for them because it, it helps answer some questions and, and also to provide some additional historical information for them. And lastly, Hans Noah, the Maritime Archaeology and History of the Hawaiian Islands Foundation. That's just more or less, I guess, a nod to myself and, and uh, Dr. Suzanne Finney. It's a very small uh, foundation that we, uh, that, that we run. But here we are. So this, let's, what, what did we talk about? Again, what, or what did we investigate? Well, basically one of those. It's a PBY-5 uh, Catalina. Now, I am not a, uh, I, don't, I don't consider myself to be an aviation historian per se, uh, but I've always been fascinated by aviation. I've done a little bit of flying myself. And I think, you know, in some respects, every plane is beautiful uh, in one way or another, but um, these, these Catalinas are just absolutely gorgeous planes. Uh, I was, I've, I've been in love with them ever since I first uh, uh, saw one. And uh, in this particular case, Naval Air Station, then Naval Air Station Kaneohe, was the home to uh, two squadrons of these Catalinas. And there was two different variants they had there. They had the PBY-5, which was just purely a flying boat, and a PBY-5A or Alpha, which was, which was the um, amphibious uh, plane. And so you think, well, what's the difference? Well, if it's purely a flying boat, it only has the capability of taking off and landing on the water. They can put a rack on the underside so they can roll them up on land so they can do maintenance and things like that. But they don't take off and land uh, from uh, a, a runway. A PBY-5A is amphibious. It can do either. It can take off and land in the water. It can also, it also has landing gear and they can take off and land on a runway. And the easiest way to tell the difference is if, if there's a great big tire right about there, then you know it's a 5A. And if there's no big tire right there, then it's probably a 5. That's, that's one way to, uh, to know for sure. Uh, looking at a profile of one, uh, that's what they look like. And uh, there's just some of, the, some of the specs on those. Um, yes, they were uh, armed. Uh, they did have 30 caliber and 50 caliber machine guns, but they could also drop bombs and depth charges. 
Okay, and what kinds of things did they participate in during uh, uh, World War II? Well, uh, they did long-range uh, reconnaissance patrols. Again, they could go almost uh, almost 2,000 uh, miles. Um, they also did anti-submarine patrols, um, and they also did search and rescue. But again, they could drop they could uh, drop depth charges and bombs uh, on uh, enemy submarines and other uh, and other uh, surface craft uh, as well. Uh, used throughout World War II by the United States, but also by other countries. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, used plenty of these. So did Australia. So did uh, Canada. Even countries like Brazil and uh, U.S. Navy used them, and also the Coast Guard. Coast Guard used them on in through the 50s, I think. Um, there are a few nations who actually used these on up through the 70s, but even today they're still around. I mean, you can sure you can find some of them on static display in museums, but there are also some that are still flying. Some of them more or less as a flying museum craft. But there are actually Catalinas that are still used today operationally. Things like uh, aerial uh, firefighting, where they can actually uh, uh, drop uh, loads of water onto uh, wildland fires. They're still used today even for that. The numbers are going down, but they're still, they're still out there. It's just still a wonderful um, aircraft. Okay, so what do we have? What did we look out, out in the uh, bay? Well, I'm going to show you some maps and some pictures and stuff that will make it more clear. But just to basically describe it so you can kind of visualize what, what we had. Um, basically, if you're familiar with Mokapu, familiar with the base, you know the hangars are there on the south edge of the, uh, of the peninsula onto the bay. Well, really just a couple of hundred yards south of that is where this site was. In about 25, 30 feet of water. Um, we've got basically the remains of the starboard uh, side of the, of the wing of one of these and the, uh, the forward section of the fuselage. Some other pieces as well, like part of the tail section as well. But we, we found enough and can identify enough that we conclude that it is a uh, PBY-5 um, Catalina. So in one context, that's what we've got. We've got a, uh, an artifact, a remnants of a single plane. Well, that's, that's nice. It's nice that we can identify that, um, but that in and of itself, I mean, that, that could be here or there because, again, it's not like it's a one-of-a-kind thing that's never been discovered before. We still have PBY-5 Catalinas that are flying today, so, hey, we have the wreckage of one. But I think what's important here is that uh, uh, this is not just a PBY-5 Catalina, but it's a specific one. It's a specific one that sank at a certain time and can get linked in to a broader story. And in this case, it's this story. If you look at this uh, map, again, as, as uh, Mahi Alani alluded to, um, December 7th, 1941, the day, day which we live in infamy, of course, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. But there was more to December 7th than just Pearl Harbor. Sure, that's what we remember the most, but we have to remember there were many, many sites on Oahu uh, that were bombed. Uh, not just Pearl Harbor, but also uh, Hickam Field, also um, uh, Wheeler Army Airfield, uh, Bellows, and of course, Naval Air Station uh, Kaneohe. And in fact, uh, Kaneohe was actually attacked about six to eight minutes prior to uh, Pearl Harbor. So Kaneohe was actually pretty much the first place on Oahu uh, that was attacked. So that, that's one of those little tidbits of history that's easy to forget. It's easy to get eclipsed by a broader picture like the attack on Pearl Harbor. We don't have to think uh, or, or stretch too far to come up with an analogy to that. I was just thinking about this a couple of days ago. Today is September 13th, 2015. Two days ago was September 11th, 2015, which was the 14th anniversary of what? The terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, right? Where the World Trade Center was attacked and the Twin Towers were brought down. But we know this, but sometimes even we, or I can only speak for myself, I have a tendency to forget what was more than just the World Trade Center, right? The Pentagon was also attacked. Hundreds of lives were lost in the Pentagon as well. And there was a fourth plane that uh, didn't reach its target because it was brought down by uh, some of the passengers, and it crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. If either of those last two things, the, the, the Pennsylvania part or the Pentagon part, had been events and nothing else happened on those days, that would have been the most important and most remembered event of that day, right, of that week, of that year probably. But because of the World Trade Center, well, they kind of get, uh, get marginalized and eclipsed a little bit. And I think we got a similar situation here. And I think we have that when you think about it throughout World War II. When I teach my history classes, it's like 
in a world history class, I only get a few days to talk about World War II, but there are thousands, thousands of amazing stories throughout this entire war that if any of these have happened apart, you know, outside that time frame, that would be the one thing you'd remember because so many amazing stories happened during that time frame, we can't always remember all of them. So that's one of the things that, uh, that we have to keep in mind. The other thing too, again, on December 7th, again, it's not just that there were other sites on Oahu that were attacked, but other sites uh, with other U.S. possessions like uh, Philippines, like uh, Guam, uh, Wake Island, but also British possessions such as uh, Malaya, Singapore, and Hong Kong. So this was a, this was a rough day for the Allies. Uh, at the hands of the Japanese in uh, in many respects. Okay, so here's a picture of a uh, PBY-5 uh, that looks like it's on fire. That's uh, uh, Some guys are on a line on the tail of that uh, plane. Uh, is this the one that's, that's later uh, sunk at the wreck site? Well, the simple answer to that is we don't know. Uh, as an archaeologist looking at this picture, I can say, well, uh, on our site that we found, we've got a starboard wing, and well, the starboard wing's still there, so maybe that could be. Um, looks like the forward section is intact, as best we can tell. Uh, so, you know, it very, it very well could be. But here's what we don't know. We don't know exactly what the circumstances were in which this particular uh, plane that we investigated uh, was sunk. We know that there was a mooring block uh, near where it was sunk, but we don't know for sure if it was at its mooring. We don't know. We know that there was there were several the, the capability of, of mooring planes there south of the where the hangars are now was possible, but we don't know. Could it be that it was actually damaged on uh, closer to the shore and that was drug out later and sunk? Maybe, but we don't know. And uh, that's one of those unfortunate things is that we don't have as much record of what took place in Kaneohe on that day as we'd like. Hans and I were talking about this one day as a military guy. You know, we like taking taking records of everything, right? You know, if you're the officer of the day, you're making note of everything. So theoretically, um, anything that happened in a given day would be very, very well documented. Okay, but we gotta remember, this was a pretty rough day. I imagine there was a lot of things that happened on December 7, 1941, that got recorded, and a lot of things that just people didn't get around to uh, recording because that became uh, overcome by events, greater, greater priorities. So we don't have as much as, as we'd like uh, to know. We do have some things though. Fortunately, we've got an a, a aviation historian that helped out Hans a lot. His name's uh, Dave Trojan, and he did some research, and there's just a few things that he was able to uh, piece together. There is eyewitness account that there were six PBY-5s on the bay uh, on December 7th in their ready status uh, positions, and that's where they attacked. Well, where were their ready status positions? Well, we don't exactly know for sure. We got something, we had this photograph, and this is not just a bad copy, it's just, a, it's just a rough photograph, but it was taken on the 16th of October, 1941. And here are several uh, uh, locations where there were a PBY-5 Catalina supposedly in their ready status. Someone who can interpret maps a heck of a lot better than me figured out that this is Coconut Island over here, and this is the, the base over here. So, you know, theoretically, this is like the rest of the base Here's that span in the bay between Mokapu and Coconut Island, and here's where these uh, were. Is that where they were on December 7th? We don't know. Or were they more uh, moored in these places closer to the uh, hangars? Well, we don't know for sure, uh, but uh, that's, that's a piece of information that we have. Um, we do know that there was loss of life on the bay. There is documentation of some of the crew members of some of the planes uh, at, uh, being killed. We don't know exactly how many for sure, but we do have some evidence, uh, some documented uh, uh, eyewitness accounts that there were um, a few people uh, who perished on the bay uh, during on that day. Were there any deaths on our site that we, that we uh, investigated? Uh, to our knowledge, uh, no. There were not any uh, human remains found. As archaeologists, when you find a wreck site and there aren't <coughs> human remains, you kind of go uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because anytime you have a loss of something, whether it be a plane or a, a ship, you know that's that's tragic enough that you lost a plane or a ship. Um, but of course, it's a thousand times, a million times worse if there was if there was loss of life. So you want to hope there wasn't loss of life. So if you find a wreck site and there's no uh, human remains on board, then at least that tells you that, well, uh, 
uh, there's no human remains right there. And there could have been a death. Maybe they were recovered, but at least you don't. Uh, at least there's no evidence of that. Um, it also makes things more complicated. If you do find human remains, then other agencies have to be uh, brought into the picture for the investigation. And then you would only be able to continue um, if the circumstances were such um, that uh, you're given no permission to uh, continue. But I guess in, in one perspective, the only the only positive thing that could come out of, of a site, if you were to come across a site and there were human remains, was maybe that might be able to answer a mystery. Maybe that might be able to bring some closure to a family who doesn't know uh, what what exactly happened to their loved one. So that's, that's perhaps one thing that could come out of that. But to our knowledge, there's nothing at our site. There's some uh, again, there was apparently there were six on the bay at large uh, on, on the bay on December 7th. Um, the disposition of several of those others is still at large. We don't know uh, what happened. Uh, should there be some of them perhaps still at the bottom of Conway Bay? Perhaps, but we're not we're not sure. We've done some searching and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, but uh, there's been no other uh, craft found and no other remains found that we know of. Here's a little bit of a picture of some other stuff that's been done. Okay, the, the site survey of this uh, site was done in uh, 1994, uh, and this is the first time, 2015, that that, that specific site where the where the Catalina was has gone back to. Um, the site, if you look, this is the uh, this is okay, these maps. This is uh, this is like the runway at Marine Corps Base Hawaii, and this is where the hangars are. And then here is uh, Kaneohe uh, Bay. It's that part. It's tucked right in near the uh, peninsula. And here's a little bit of a closer view. Here's hangar one, two, three, four, and five as they existed then and as they exist uh, today. Uh, our wreck site that we investigated was around in, in this area right here. Okay, so not too far uh, from the uh, not too far from the base. I mean, just a couple hundred yards um, off. What was done in 2000 uh, for for mass was hey, are there any of the other uh, planes that are out there? Let's take a look. Let's investigate further. So what Hans and the crew did was they used remote sensing, uh, a towed side scan sonar and a towed proton magnetometer that they would drag behind the boat and they would just drag lines back and forth uh, in the area uh, uh, where the, some of the mooring uh, buoys should have been uh, just to see if there was anything that, that might, might be the remains of one of the other uh, Catalinas. And basically, there were several uh, magnetometer hits that were uh, investigated and some side scan sonar hits as well, but, and, and they would send divers down to investigate, but nothing else was really found, just basically clumps of, uh, clumps of uh, silt, nothing, nothing really else uh, found. One of the things that we did this year was the boat that we had didn't have a, a, a formal side scan sonar capability, but it had a limited sonar capability. We call it, we call it the pseudo side scan, and it was just an integral part of the boat and just for fun, uh, when we had some downtime, we would actually uh, go out. Again, here's about where our site is. But remember here, if, if the map extended, this is about where those uh, ready positions from the 16th of October, 1941, were over by Coconut Island. And just for fun, we went outside this area and actually made some passes over here just to see if we would uh, catch anything. And, and we really, there's a couple of things that looked like they might have been promising, you know, very, very distinct, uh, uh, a vertical point, but we went down down on them as more or less just a clump, just a, a pinnacle of silt. So, so that doesn't mean that they're not out there. So that's one of the things that may be done later is uh, get out there with some better um, equipment uh, to, uh, to to investigate further. So one of the questions that's, that some of you may be wondering, okay, well, if the, if the field school was done in 1994, um, why go back? Why go back to that site again if it's already been documented? They did a plan view or, or top-down uh, drawing of the site. That was the result of the 1994 field school, which I'll show you in a minute. And, and our goal was to do the same thing, and that's what we accomplished. So you might say, well, why bother? Why do the, why do the same thing all over again? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, because... Again, remember that the primary mission here was training. Okay, it's primarily to train a crew in how to do uh, maritime archaeology, and it's a great site uh, for that. Visibility is not so great, which makes it an even better site. A little more of a challenging uh, uh, project area. Um, so just just for that reason alone, it was it was worth going back to. 
Uh, but, you know, so why not die the same site every year? Well, you know, but you want to try and contribute something to the archaeological uh, 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 picture as well. So it's better to vary it up some. But here's the other reason why it's a good idea to go back, especially after 21 years, is that it um, has to do with the site formation process. You know, site formation process begins when the event takes place, which brought this thing down, whether it be a boat or a, or a, a plane or whatever. It, it begins the moment that uh, catastrophic event happens and the site formation process ends, well, never. It never ends. So anytime you do an archaeological investigation, all it is is a snapshot in time. It doesn't stop. That process doesn't stop. So questions can come up. Well, <clears throat> how dynamic is that site environment? Is it something that's going to change a lot over 21 years or is it going to be something that changes a little over the course of 21 years? And we'll show you some things and I'll let you be the judge of that uh, here in a little bit. But that's that's the couple of reasons why it's worthwhile to revisit a, a site like this and why we and why we did it. So um, this is just some uh, in action uh, photos. Uh, here's the uh, here's the boat and the, uh, and the and where we launched out of it. What we call what they call Sag Harbor on the uh, southwestern uh, tip, basically of uh, Mokapu Peninsula. Uh, that's where a uh, waterfront operations is based out of. Here's, here's us uh, folks getting ready for uh, for a dive. This gives you an idea of what the visibility was like. Uh, on the best day we were out there, it was maybe 12 to 15 feet, and that was on like like one hour period of one day. The rest of the time, it was it was more like five feet um, or less. So it wasn't wasn't the best conditions, but again, uh, a good a good training Great environment. Days. What's that? Great wind days. Um, for the most part, yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't too bad. Weather, weather was pretty pretty nice overall. But um, we would try and predict, oh, well, you know, these, these are the conditions that are going on right now. So, so maybe this is what the visibility would be like today. And it, and it would be all over, all over the map. Sometimes affected by the tides a little bit, but sometimes not. So we would dive. We used to do two dives in the morning and then in the afternoon in the lab, uh, working on uh, uh, what you uh, came up with. And we'll show, we'll, I'll take you through that process uh, here in a little bit. But... Um, just an idea of some of the things that we uh, we, we found. Okay, here's a. Um, this is the uh, this is the, uh, the the bow of the aircraft, and basically here's the uh, basically the cockpit. And fortunately, um, in Pensacola, one of the uh, PBY fives that's in the uh, Naval Aviation Museum uh, has some cutaway sections. So those photos of that kind of thing is great. So you can actually start to associate um, what what's going on. You see the remnant of a base uh, of, a, of a tape measure here. Basically, we had a we had a baseline along the uh, main axis of the fuselage and also along the main axis of the um, of the uh, starboard wing. And that's a way that the uh, divers can take measurements off that baseline to kind of fix their positions on their uh, when, when they're when they're taking uh, measurements. The other thing that's great in addition to like an actual example of a, of a Catalina with cutaways, is lots and lots of uh, uh, manuals uh, <coughs> that have a lot of the details uh, from the aircraft. So Hans was fortunate enough to have copies of some of these, and a lot of these things you can even find online these days, so you can get an idea of, of what we're looking at, you know, and especially when parts of the hull start to deteriorate and you can actually see in there anyway, it can kind of illuminate uh, what, you, what you've got. Okay, now here's here's uh, here's the nose of the aircraft, and it's, it, again, it's kind of tilted to where its uh, starboard side is uh, down here, and its port side is up here. So we're kind of looking at the front uh, this way, um, and there was a couple of mysteries with with respect to this. And again, the photos some, can sometimes be illuminating and sometimes not. There's a couple of these holes that we discovered that we didn't really know what they were. There's a hole right here on the uh, on the starboard side of the craft. And then on both sides, both starboard and port side, um, there's uh, there's these holes. And, and we couldn't figure out what you know, where these holes came from. If you look at this, here's a photograph of one. Well, well what do those holes really associate themselves with? Well, we're, you know, we're, not, we're not really sure. Hey, let's take a look at the one in the uh, museum. Well, great. Okay, well, there's that one. There's that one hole right here, okay. Uh, right next to the uh, the, the, the bombardier's uh, window, okay, and there it is again, right? 
And then here's these two holes again, and well, you can't really you can't really tell what that's associated with on this one. So it was kind of a mystery. Well, again, welcome back, Dave Trojan, our aviation historian, who just about three weeks ago sent an email to Hans with a picture from another uh, Catalina that's being restored at the uh, at the Pima Museum in uh, Tucson, Arizona, where there's a lot of historical crap, and he sent us this picture. So here's that here's that hole again. And then look at that. If you look, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to tell maybe, but we've actually got, actually got rivets along, along here. So in this particular uh, craft, in this particular version, there's actually these, uh, 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 riveted, these riveted uh, holes that were uh, much easier, much more easily removed. And they either popped that out or corroded away along the edge of where they were riveted. So that kind of solved that mystery. And what's this hole for? Well, it, what it is, is it's an arm hole that you can actually open up during flight so the bombardier can actually stick his arm out and clean the window while he's in flight. It's got a little, it's got a little roll top desk tech cover that would be in here. So like it would, it would roll down and then roll up. But, you know, if it's still dirty, he could actually stick his arm out there. But again, we have these things, other examples that can help answer some of these uh, questions, <coughs> help solve some of these mysteries, which is great. Okay, here's uh, one, you say, what's this? Oh, well, you, you, if you look hard enough, you can kind of figure it out. But then when you look at the example from, uh, from Pensacola, it's even more clear. This is the anchor. This is actually the sea anchor. You know, obviously, it's a flying boat. So it's got to have the capability to anchor itself if it wants to. So, and there it is intact. So what does that tell us? Well, it just tells us that it had the anchor and it wasn't, it wasn't uh, cast out. Um, that doesn't tell us whether or not the the plane was moored because you wouldn't need the anchor to moor. You just you just go straight to the, uh, the mooring ball. But at least we know that one fact that the anchor is, is intact. Some other interesting things we found. Um, for those of you that uh, know your aviation, you know, usually on a lot of planes, especially these days, you know, the controls like for the, uh, the, the throttle, the propeller, the mixture, all those controls are usually down on the console. Well, in some planes, particularly back in the day, um, the controls were actually, you'd actually reach up for them. And here's the case, we're inside the cockpit, and here's, some con here's the, uh, the engine controls, the, th the throttles for the two engines, and you'd actually reach up and control those. If you notice, they're, they're not in the same position. So what does that tell us? Well, one of the speculations was, well, maybe, maybe it was out on the bay, and they were try they'd fired up one of the engines, they were trying to get underway, but, and then the plane sank. Well, you know, maybe. That, that, that could be an explanation, or it's possible that someone may have uh, may, may have messed with them at some point before they were too corroded over and overgrown with coral to be moved. Again, it's one of those mysteries we don't we don't know, but it's it's interesting information uh, nonetheless, and also very interesting that these are intact. By the way, the good thing about this site is is that <clears throat> yes, there are divers who've been to this site, but we don't have to worry about getting getting pillaged quite as much because it's actually in the restricted area for the for the active runway at Marine Corps Base. So if a, if a boat were to go in there during the day, uh, the waterfront ops is going to come and chase them out. Okay. Could you still sneak in at night? Well, sure. But, um, you know, you're not supposed to. So that's, that's one thing that helps us out um, a little bit. Okay. This is just an idea. Again, this, this, that's, that's on a great day that you can actually, that, that the uh, Jeff probably took that picture, um, that you can actually see the divers working that well. Look at that great buoyancy control, too. Yeah, I, wish, I wish I still had that, you know. Don, I saw you put your knees on the wreck. Yeah, what? What are you talking about? I don't know. But uh, that's, that's, good, uh, that's good skills right there. And this just gives you an idea of what kinds of uh, things we were looking at. You know, a lot of right angles, which helps when you're drawing uh, the, the, the um, it actually, uh, you know, a human-made thing actually has some of these uh, right angles that you can work with. Um, there was, uh, Jeff and Hans, when they were uh, cruising around the area, actually found some uh, shell casings. Um, that was kind of interesting. Uh, that might be about the same size as a, a 30 caliber. Um, was it associated with the Catalina? Could they have been uh, shooting at a target uh, on that uh, day? Uh, Probably not, but um, it's it's interesting anyway that there were some some remnants of uh, shell casings there. Is there a year on that? I there there's there's some markings. Um, there's like an L like and a something. Yeah, I mean, you should 
Okay, that's that's very interesting. I, I can't remember uh, how far Hans got in terms of tracking that down, but that's great. Maybe I'll talk to you more after uh, for that. Might be able to uh, pinpoint that a little bit more. Sure, thanks. And uh, this is just an example of the uh, the pontoons, which are out on the uh, on the wingtips, which they would put down uh, for for takeoff and landing. And of course, we got good diagrams of those. And we've actually got the remnants of that uh, uh, pontoon there on the uh, on the starboard side. This is just an example of what a diver's slate would look like on a typical day. You know, we'd go down and. Uh, Again, you're going to take some references off of the baseline, but for the most part, you're just going to be going to a section of the wing or the fuselage, whatever your team's going to be working on, and you have a mylar uh, sheet of paper on a, on a plastic slate like the ones you saw in the previous pictures, and you're just going to, you're just going to take some notes. What I usually like to try and do is I, I usually try to take a few minutes kind of visualize it, kind of put it in perspective in my mind before I start to draw it. I figure out what scale I'm going to draw. And then, and then I start to draw it. You want to try and keep things with respect to each other as best you can when you're drawing, but the most important thing is that you take good measurements. If you take good measurements, if you didn't draw it just right, the measurements will kind of, will kind of bring things out and they'll, and they'll help out um, a lot. Um, when you get back to the lab, you've got to be able to translate that uh, to, your, to your paper. So hopefully you took good notes while you were, um, while you were underwater and, and took good measurements. Uh, inevitably, somebody forgets a measurement. You got to go back the next day and uh, re, re catch a measurement you didn't quite get right, and hopefully it's not the last day. But there's always that one last day where people have to go back and get the measurements that they didn't get before. Um, so that's what that's what a slate would look like on a typical day. You always want to make sure you got the right information, what day it was, in general, what you're doing. Hey, doe with Don. You know, I was helping. I was helping her out. That was Allison's. Then you're going to go back to the lab. Now, um, some things have changed in terms of technology and, and other things we like to do in a more uh, traditional way. Some, some sites you work on, you take your notes underwater, you go back to the lab, you sit down on a computer, and you get on a CAD program, your computer-assisted uh, 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 drafting, and you'll, uh, you'll figure everything out on the computer and cut your lines and all that stuff. I've been on a couple of projects where we did that. What we like to do is a little more old school, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, good, it's good training. Uh, what we'd actually do is, and it's a little bit hard to tell here, but what you have right now, this is kind of like one of the final processes where they're actually uh, doing some inking onto a mylar sheet. But if you look closely, see there's, there's a sheet of graph paper underneath. People are going to be going from their, uh, their notes onto a sheet of graph paper and then you know, making erasure, erasures and redrawing and stuff like that, getting it to where you want it, and then you're going to uh, when you're ready for the final part, uh, you put it underneath this uh, piece of uh, mylar, you line it up right, and then you trace over it. So here's, uh, here's Jesse, one of the students, and he's working on a section that he was working on, and he's basically tracing the lines of the, uh, of the work that he did, and that, and that kind of takes it uh, towards, towards the final product. Um, so in some respects, that's, that's the same technology that's been used for decades, and we like using that. There's some elements where I think uh, technology uh, helps us out, and, and I actually changed my mind about a couple things uh, this particular summer. Uh, back in the day, um, photography and videography was something great, and it was uh, more of an enhancement, like uh, underwater photos. You, know, you take your Nikonis 5 camera and take, try and take some beautiful pictures underwater of the site you're working on, and then you take them in to get them uh, processed. And hope for the best. You know, a week later you'll get your pictures back, and hopefully you didn't take uh, junk pictures. Uh, but nowadays, with digital photography, digital underwater photography, it's a game changer because you can actually see how good your picture is while you're underwater, and you can take a gazillion of them, and it doesn't really matter. You don't have to say, "Well, I've only got 36 or 24 on this roll. I better make them count." You can take as many as you want, and sometimes the students will actually bring down their own cameras and be you know, taking pictures. And I was getting a little frustrated on one of the first days because we're, we're drawing, we're mapping, and a couple of my students are down, and we're drawing, and they're, get the camera down, taking pictures, pick, pitch. I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, guys, you know, I'm thinking I can't talk to them. I'm like, guys, put the dang cameras away and draw, okay? We got work to do, okay? Yeah, take a few uh, photos, whatever. It's beautiful, um, great, but just draw. Come on, let's get to it. 
But uh, wow, you get back to the lab and you start getting out your notes and you say, well, I think this was kind of laying across from there, but by my drawings, it's kind of hard. By my, my notes and my drawing, it's kind of hard to tell. I wonder, But lo and behold, you break out the camera and put it right there on the screen while we're in the lab. You, Aha, that's right. That's what it looked like. Now, you can't get the exact measurements, but it can help bring some of the perspective back into it. So that, that kind of changed my mind is that, hey, you know, it's not just a fun thing to take some cool pictures of, but it actually can actually help us once we get back to the lab. So my, my mind was changed on that. And my students knew that too. They knew, they knew they'd, they'd, they'd work me over and change my mind. So that was good. That was good. So let's talk final product. Let's, let's, let's see the final product from 1994. What did this look like? Well, it looked like that. It's beautiful, right? So we got a fuselage, right? Here's the, here's the nose, and here's the cockpit, and there's actually a lobster trap that we didn't have that anymore. Uh, so there's the there's the, the, the fuselage, and here's our starboard wing, and here's the the nacelle it's called, where the, the, the houses the uh, the engine and goes all the way out to the wing tip, and here's the, uh, the, the pontoon, and here's the tip, what we figured out was the tail section. They, they mapped that in '94 as well, and there was actually a barrel. Uh, there was actually a training barrel that the dolphins used to use. If some some of you may know that that was a training area for the uh, the dolphins that the Navy. Uh, 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 the, the seals used to uh, train with, and it, it was out there. So that's it's pretty nice. It's some pretty good detail here. Um, I think they did. I think they did a great job. Well, how much different did ours look? Well, not that much different. Not too much has changed. It doesn't seem to to have changed anyway. Um, I'll, I'll do. A, I don't want. I don't want to play with your eyes too much, but I'll go back and forth a little bit so you can kind of get an idea of how much has changed. 94, 15, 94, 15. So it almost looks like, well, maybe the, the, the wing looks like it might have shifted a little bit. Well, maybe, but I think maybe that's more of a little bit of a fudge factor in terms of, you know, it's, it's hard to line things up underwater. So that could be, that could be just a factor of uh, it not lining up right. If you notice, too, the, uh, if you look at the tail section, the orientation looks a little bit different. I think that's probably more of a fudge factor in the... Uh, you try and you try and be as accurate as you can when you're measured underwater, but it's not always easy. Um, the one thing I think, again, not to not to put too much kudos on our team, but I think we captured detail just a little bit better than they did in '94, even though our field school was a little bit shorter. Particularly if you look in areas like um, here, uh, along towards the end of the uh, of the wing. If you look at '94. It see, they kind of it's, they kind of summarized a little bit, I think. Kind of well, it kind of looks like that from about here to there. So we'll just kind of draw it out where we're, where we were a little bit more tighter in terms of making it more accurate. But it does also look like, particularly if you're looking in the cell area, it does look like there's been you know if if that was accurate, it does look like well you know the aluminum has been corroding a little bit, uh, corroding away uh, just a little bit. So that site formation process is still active. It hasn't torn the heck out of it in 21 years, but it has had somewhat of an impact, or at least that's the way it uh, seemed to us. So, but again, I think they did a great product back in 94, and, and I think our team did a, did a pretty good job um, as well. Okay, next, here's one of the great things about, sorry? Okay. <laughs> um, one of the great things about uh, a team like what we had is, um, in the scientific diving world, you know, maritime archaeology is kind of a small piece of it. Um, uh, there's also a lot of marine geologists that do underwater work, but there's an awful lot of marine biologists and some really good ones uh, all around the world, particularly here in uh, Hawaii. Um, over the past several years, a lot of our uh, students have actually come from marine biology. Um, they're they're interested in being marine biologists, so they don't have a professional interest in maritime archaeology, but they want to try it out because, hey, it's underwater work. Any Anytime you can get any kind of training underwater, regardless of your field, it's going to improve your own skills. Okay, But one thing many biologists have become interested in, particularly in the last couple of decades, is actually using their biology skills to study uh, wreck sites because they're artificial reefs. Hey, how is the biota different in this area where this wreck site is compared to 300 yards away. So there's been some interest in that. It just so happened that a lot of our students uh, this year were marine biologists. So Han said, hey, do some fish counts and stuff and, 
and tell us about, make notes of what you saw underwater. So uh, it's not very often in a maritime archaeology field school you can get some results like this, but, but we actually did. So you get an idea of what kind of uh, invertebrates there are. Uh, and also, um, next slide is some of the fish species. So lots and lots of different kinds of uh, fish were identified. You know, did I notice all of these? Uh, no, not really. But our marine biology types really did. So they, so they got, they got all that. So good, good on them, and that that adds to the, uh, that adds to the mix. So that helped out uh, quite a bit. Very interesting. Okay. And uh, last thing. So you know, basically, you ask, well, what now? Well, one of the things that Hans had thought about was it'd be great if we could do a photo mosaic. Um, ideally, we'd be able to put that together. That's basically where you, you know, do multiple photos and line them all up and they're able to uh, get an accurate picture. Because again, with the visibility being what it was, to be able to come up high enough to be able to take a picture of the whole uh, plane, you wouldn't be able to get it. Even at that depth, just less than 30 feet, that'd be rough anyway, even if you had perfect visibility. But photo mosaics are done uh, nowadays. Um, with, with the kind of photography that we have, um, it, would, it would be kind of challenging to do that. We're hoping to bring uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Tony Casterly, out uh, sometime. He's like the, <coughs> he works for NOAA too. He was my roommate at grad school. Um, I taught him uh, uh, nitrox. Um, I was one of his diving instructors and, and he uh, sur surpassed me and uh, now does Trimix. He dives in places like the USS Monitor off North Carolina. He just posted some great pictures the other day. And he used to always joke that he'd, he'd let he'd still let me carry his tanks for him. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, hopefully he'll come out and uh, and we can put together a photo mosaic there. And uh, just other things, uh, continued protection, um, which Marine Corps Base is already doing, and also with the uh, uh, Sunken Military Craft Act. Basically, that's a uh, a, a law from 2004 that just kind of summarizes some some previous laws. It basically, says the U.S. does not give up sovereignty the U.S. to, to any of its military. Uh, craft or aircraft, uh, uh, watercraft, or whatever. If it's a U.S. Uh, uh, piece of gear and it sank, it's it's always going to be U.S. property, so it's always protected that way. It also applies to foreign military stuff that are sunk in our waters, particularly if we won the war, right? Um, like the German U-boats off of uh, North Carolina and such. And uh, continued investigation to try and find out more about these other PBYs that are still at large. Will we ever find any of these? Uh, with remote sensing and if we do hey there's another field school right so and there's there's my final photo this is the team getting ready to go out one of our uh, final mornings there's uh hadley hadley she's our uh, boat captain uh, extraordinaire uh from noaa uh, we wouldn't be able to do that this project without her so um that's the crew and uh appreciate your time are there any uh, are there any, any questions we got, we got time for a few questions right? yep. yes sir Inside the aircraft, you can reach in or with a GoPro inside or something. Have you attempted to find any serialized elements like the builder's plate or the or radio that might be serialized? They they have, but I mean, and we were able to actually go in uh, and, and kind of kind of penetrate a little bit uh, safely and be able to uh, look around and get some pretty good shots, but but no, no areas where there was any kind of plates, and it was all pretty corroded over as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, consolidated. That, that's the name of the company that built those. They built a few other aircraft as well. Yes, sir. Have you ever any light, fast light, any any light? Uh, me, me, myself. Uh, I, I have not, and again, in this project, there were there, there were none. But uh, there have been some, like for example, you know, I just mentioned the monitor and my friend Tony Casterly. Um, that was a Civil War uh, ironclad that was sunk uh, right after the uh, uh, Civil War, and uh, the the turret was recovered, and, and and sure enough, they had two crew members inside. And so, even though it was from Civil War time period, they got the JPAC folks out here uh, from the. Uh, uh, joint POW MIA accounting command did some forensic anthropology. We were able to identify the remains. So, so it does it does happen. Yes, there 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 are a number of sites that they the, the, the Hunley had some uh, had some some uh, uh, remains on there as well. So it, it does happen in the field. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. The first one, though, is have you looked at, have you been able to find any satellite multispectral that you work with NOAA that might have more information in it than you can get uh, of, of the S water side? Um, well, uh, that, that's an interesting question. One of the things that's, that's, that's a real tweet, a real treat is you know, a lot of people like the PB, uh, like now the Marine Corps base, um, the, uh, the P3s, they have a magnetometer. So I was like, hey, we should talk to them and see if they can give us any of our data and maybe we can find some magnetometer hits. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if anyone's really uh, pursued that that much. Um, there might be some stuff with Noah, but you, you know what's great? Google Earth. People have actually gotten on Google Earth and and found places. Hey, that looks like it might be something. Make a note of the lat long to, and go out to a site and sure enough, find things. And there are. Doing that in the water here, right now. Yep. Uh, so that's a, there, there's a there's a P5 Amtrak assault amphibian vehicle that's uh, on the north side of Mokapu off of uh, Pyramid Rock Beach that we've investigated. And, and when you go on Google Google Earth, sure enough, you can you can find it. The, the landing craft that we looked at in, in 2014 off the south shore, uh, south and west of uh, the inlet at Pearl Harbor. You can, you can see those on Google. You have to know what you're looking for, but if you know where you're looking, you're like, yep, I think, yep, that's it. And so it does help. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's, no, there's no remnants of the engine itself, which, which again implies, you know, maybe, maybe that was just salvaged right away. Maybe there's other elements of it that were salvaged, but again, no no records of that. And yes. On the wing, as you showed in the, in the later photograph, right. you had squiggly lines on the forward edge just outside the nacelle. Was that growth? Um, yeah. yeah, that was probably indicative of either coral growth or where it would have yeah. uh, gone into the sand. That's more than like, yeah, you can't, what we do, uh, you can't, yeah. yeah, oh yeah, 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 that was, this is coral growth. But then also we, we have something we love in the field that you can't really tell that it's stippling. We, you stipple and that's the sand. That, that kind of shows the forward edge of the thing where it's sticking into the sand. And, and the other piece, ray ball, it just have to be transects just like archaeology. Yep. So it's a, a yep. natural in that sense. A absolutely. In one sense, it's kind of sort of more important for us to be a little bit more accurate per se because we actually got a... Uh, you know, a man-made, human-made thing that we're trying to identify. But yeah, the, the, the detail is important regardless. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've done some terrestrial archaeology too, and theoretically we should be as accurate underwater as you are on land, but you just have to do the best you can. You just have to do the best you can. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, there's, there's, there's none right now. There's, there's not like we're like compared to the USS Arizona where there's actual oil tricking up. No, I mean, I'm, there, there probably was, um, uh, you know, initially after this, but again, they're not going to, you know, the, the, the fuel, some of the fuel I'm sure probably leaked out, but it probably stopped after a while. And, uh, there's probably not enough, probably wasn't enough oil on there to last very long. There probably was some initially, but not anymore. Right. This is the only one from Kanyoi that we actually know of the location. I do also know, um, you know, there some of the uh, PBYs were destroyed. Um, they were actually up on the, you know, on the on the taxiway up on the tarmac, and there's actually some wreckage that they found in the back of Ulupa'u Crater. If you're familiar with uh, Marine Corps Base. Uh, uh, Hawaii, the, the peninsula, um, back where the rifle range is, there's an area where they've, they've dumped some military gear over the edge, and, and there's actually some PBY remnants there as well, where they just dumped them over the side. But those are the only that's the only one we know of in the water. Isn't that sort of what it was like, the positioning of things, that, as opposed to where's the rest of it? This is like just bits and pieces. Well, yeah, so the, so the mystery is, you know, well, um, you know, so here's the main part of the fuselage, and then here's the tail section. So, you know, there's a little bit missing here, um, and, you know, the, for the most part, it doesn't look like it's tucked under, under the sand here. Uh, the, you know, the big question is what the heck happened to the other half of the wing? We, we don't know. You know, again, which when you start to backtrack, you look at that one picture, 
that where that one Catalina was up close to the shore and that wing was blown clear off, well, you know, right. that could be a reason why you're not going to find anything out there if it was it. Could be. It's on the beach. Right. They take the engine off, haul it out, and make yep. sure it's not in any of the seaplane landing runways, as it were. And this yep. is off the runway, right? And it's off the, yep. the charted seaplane landing spots. Right. It's just south of where the hangars are, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it could be. You know, you, then you might ask, well, why the heck, why didn't they uh, salvage the anchor, stuff like that? But yeah, I just said, ah, we got enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah.